Hi, my name is Mike Masalam. I'm the Chairman and CEO of Edwards Life Sciences. Hello, I'm Kim Kripe. I'm the President and CEO of Chalk Children's Hospital. I'm Paul Mirage, and I'm Chairman of MIG. Henry Samueli, Co-Founder and Chairman of Broadcom Corporation. I think to be successful today, it's, it's critical that you're true to yourself um, and what your interests are. So passion is a must. But when you can find such a passion that triggers you inside, and you follow that dream, follow that passion, good things will happen. Business innovation, we know, touches everyone. Uh, everyone has an opportunity to change their business for the better. Change is what's happening today. And the rate of change is picking up every day. And change is what's creating opportunities. There truly has never been a time where there's more opportunity available for young people to be successful. Well, we have an amazing panel, and uh, I want to get to hear them. So I'm going to introduce, they really do not need any introduction, truthfully. Uh, and of course, not needing an introduction is better than not deserving one. So let's, uh, but let me just very, very briefly introduce our speakers. I think they're very well known to all of you. And let me start with Kimberly. Kimberly is the president and CEO of Chalk, Chalk Children's, one of the top pediatric healthcare systems in the nation. Uh, affiliated with UC Irvine, Chalk Children's Healthcare Network includes two state-of-the-art hospitals in Orange and Mission Viejo, several community clinics in Santa Ana, Newport Beach, Costa Mesa, and Garden Grove. And uh, Kim was recognized in 1999 by the March of Dimes with the Mentor in Medicine Award, a very prestigious award. And she was honored with a Women in Business Award in the year 2000. And this past June, at the Trust Summit, which is co-sponsored by OC Metro, the Values Institute at DGWB and California State University Fullerton, Kim was named Orange County's most trustworthy leader. Welcome, Kim. Uh, by the way, these are in alphabetical order. Our next uh, panelist is Paul Mirage, who I just met tonight. And, uh, Obviously, I'm uh, honored to have Paul as a wonderful friend and mentor. And uh, Paul, of course, and Lily are true visionaries, very creative. You can hear a lot about the innovativeness that went into his very, very successful career. But of course, he founded Chef America, a uh, startup frozen food company, way back in 1975 with his brother David. And through the development of a food product that was nowhere on this planet and today is in everyone's refrigerator, Hot Pockets, uh, this company became extremely successful and later he sold it in 2002 to Nestle. Uh, right now, Paul, I would say, is uh, a philanthropist, a philanthropist bar none. Uh, his family foundation is, uh, helps uh, children, helps college students. Uh, he's focused on a mission to give back to America. He's helping improving the quality of life through education, through, his, through the American dream, through high hopes for children, through the Mirage Institute, through his U.S.-Israeli uh, technology, a bridge that he's created, and of course, through naming the Paul Mirage School of Business. So welcome, Paul. And you've also uh, heard already from Mike Musalem, who you obviously recognize as chairman and CEO of Edwards Life Sciences. And Edwards, uh, even though you saw that clip, I mean, to recognize global leadership in the area of heart valves, that's not a position that's easy to come by. And what an accomplishment of this company. Some of you, I hope, read the paper this morning, the OC Register, and saw the article in which Mike talked about, not, not the, the stock price, not the the share value, but how the company has really improved the quality of life for so many individuals. And, and I think that's a great tribute to uh, individuals like Mike who lead this company. He's currently on the boards and executive committees of uh, AvaMed, California Healthcare Institute, and Octane, and he is a trustee of the University of Cal California Irvine Foundation. Mike. And our fourth panelist is Henry Samueli, uh, of course, co-founder of Broadcom, 
serves as chairman of the board and chief technical officer, and in this role, he leads the vision of Broadcom's research. Uh, Hen uh, Henry Samuel is also a distinguished adjunct professor in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at the University of California, Irvine. He is a named inventor of 69 patents in the United States. In June of 2012, he was awarded the Marconi Society Prize and Fellowship, an amazing achievement and accomplishment. And in December of 2011, the Global Semiconductor Alliance named him the winner of the Dr. Morris Chang Exemplary Leadership Award. Henry? And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dan Lubeck. Uh, he is the founder and managing director of Solus Capital Partners and also a board member of Team Kids. Dan has participated in more than 65 company acquisitions and divestitures. And prior to founding uh, Solus in 2002, he co-founded a leveraged bio company, Unique Investment Corporation. He serves on a variety of private company boards of directors and advisor boards, of which he currently chairs two. He's also lectured at prominent universities and business schools on the subject of private equity and finance, and very shortly, we will have him inside our classroom as well. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Hello. All right, thanks everybody. Well, welcome, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, let's get started. Uh, let's talk about innovation, since this is the Innovative Thinkers Forum, and uh, this is, in fact, an innovative way that Team Kids has found to reach out to the community, but, but I think we'd love to hear from all of you. How important is innovation in what you do in your companies, or what you did in your company, to their ultimate success? I want to just go down the line. This is a good one for all you guys. No, I'd say 99.999% <laughs> of our success is due to innovation, uh, which probably everybody on this panel can say. Um, I mean, it's the lifeblood of our economy. Uh, we are in an innovation economy uh, in this country, especially in this state, um, and it's imperative for all of us to uh, continue that trend, training our young kids to be innovative thinkers and to be creative and entrepreneurial, and that's what keeps us going. I'll tell you what, if, if all you guys agree with that statement, that it's such a big part of what you do, then let me switch it. How do you drive innovation? Uh, that, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, actually, easy to say, hard to do. And particularly when companies start getting larger, it gets particularly tough. You see lots of the best innovation many times comes from smaller companies. So having that climate where people are willing to think big, people are willing to take risks, people are willing to reach high, uh, that's, that's not simple stuff. And uh, you know, we, we struggle with it. We, we do it well sometimes. Part of, part of it that you know, I like to talk about amongst our own folks is the ability to tolerate a certain amount of failure. I, I don't know what it's like in the high-tech industry or what it's like in retail or in hospitals, but in the medical technology, we're, when we end up with a bright idea, we're wrong way more often than we're right. And being able to tolerate that failure and encourage people and come back and change and adjust and, and uh, come back for more, having that determination, uh, th that's everything. You guys agree with that? I, I absolutely agree with it, and I think um, so. I think the size of your enterprise is certainly a factor, and how you can create a culture that actually rewards risk taking and failure is um, something that requires, I think, a very solid commitment from the, the senior leadership of an institution. Um, in healthcare, I'm thinking about um, the innovation in your company. We're so highly regulated, and compliance is just beat into healthcare providers. So you've got a, a, a culture that's set up in a way that really wouldn't reward risk taking and wouldn't celebrate failures. So to be very purposeful about the importance of innovating, um, it, it, it's easy to want to do better, but to try to figure out how you can balance the need to have um, reliable outcomes and also reward uh, risk taking is, is challenging. 
Okay, so everybody has said everything, so. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I agree with everything that has been said, of course, but let me just take a little different tack from a different, a different angle on this, uh, because to my mind, um, the most necessary uh, condition for innovation is change. So without change, you don't have the opportunity to actually innovate. Uh, and, and change can come about in a lot of different ways. Uh, certainly technology, changes in technology creates new opportunities. Uh, changes in globalization has created a lot of opportunities. Changes in socioeconomic factors create opportunities like now people are getting older. That, you know, that itself creates a lot of opportunities. Government edicts like Obamacare, that's going to create a lot of opportunities. So to me, one of the most important things to consider in trying to create innovation or, or drive innovation is to get the people who are around you to recognize change as it happens and, and to be open to it, to embrace it. And if, if you get the organization that is geared that way and the individual who's geared that way is going to be able to innovate in addition to everything else, all the other conditions that are necessary. Uh, so, and interestingly enough, I think each of us have to reinvent ourselves all the time because the rate of change is picking up uh, and is ever faster now than it was before, even 10 years ago. So you guys all mentioned that part of this innovation and part of adapting to change involves risk, and with risk comes failure. Do you have any examples of some really big failures that stand out in your mind, the ones that were really formative in, in, in maybe decisions you make today? Anybody want to volunteer? Mike, seems like you've got one in mind. I have a, I have a long list, actually. Um, I try and forget about those. That's, it helps you move on. Uh, you know, one of, one of my probably highest profile failures, this goes back to the 90s, you know, lots of times we're going through a, a period of high change in healthcare where everything's going to change. We were going through one of those in the early 90s, remember, Hillary Care was coming and managed care, and you couldn't just be a device maker anymore. You, you needed to be, you needed to go upstream, and you needed to vertically integrate, you needed to be involved in the, the service offering, and, and you couldn't just be a device guy. And so we had some really bright consultants that came in and taught us all about that. And, uh, and so I was in, I was, you know, I'm ready to embrace change. And so we, we made uh, what we're called oxygenators. So when you, you're going through an open heart surgery and your blood is, is pumped outside your body, you, you, it goes through one of these circuits. Well, there's actually people that run those circuits and the, some of them had actually organized into businesses. And so we went out and cornered the market on perfusion service. So we ended up with 1,000 employees that went into work in hospitals every day that ran the heart-lung machines. Um, and we thought that was going to be brilliant because they ran the thinking, we make this stuff, they run the stuff, it will be one big happy family. It was one of the worst ideas uh, ever. Um, you know, we ended up trying everything. You know, we changed the leadership a couple of times because that must have been it and so forth. And eventually, it just didn't work. Culturally, the folks that were running the machines really didn't want to buy the company stuff. They wanted choice. Uh, and you, you could picture some of the cultural things. They were more affiliated with their hospital and their team than they were with our company. And anyway, it, it didn't end up working. We, we sold it all at a big loss, and I learned some kind of lesson there. Maybe mostly about just not necessarily taking consultants at their word, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always a good one. You yeah, know, when you're Kim? hearing your story, I think um, especially when an idea is your idea, and, and I have lots of ideas, my friends right here could attest to um, how many of them are very bad ideas. So <laughs> knowing when to accept that the idea isn't either right for the time or the technology isn't there, 
Um, I, I find it's very difficult, even now, after many, many failures, to, to be able to recognize uh, sooner than later that it's, it's time to regroup or give up on an idea. So that was a way to eliminate mistakes, but was there one that stands out in your mind when you think back that really the, the pain still resonates a little today? Um, it would be hard to pick just one, honestly. I, I tend to stick with an idea, and I'm very determined, and I, um, but the integration, so before I worked with Chalk, I'll pick one before I worked with Chalk, I worked for a, um, a good thought. very, very good thought, um, a large uh, proprietary healthcare system that uh, integrated horizontally and um, centralized everything. And, and your comments, so we were an insurance company, a hospital company, we owned doctors, um, and drove that model to the point it, it blew up. So I think um, really understanding with innovation, the idea has to be a good idea. You have to be able to mobilize it, but it has to have value to people. Um, and so trying to centralize a business that really is a local community business was um, a painful lesson. So I, I could go on and on, but it's a similar story, I think, mm -hmm. to what Mike's thinking about. Which one do you guys want to go next? I let, let, let Henry confess first. So that, <laughs> no, I'm, Henry's got one. I guess. I'm not sure. I'm having it, a sounds like, it sounds like it's better to talk about a former company. <laughs> there you go. Well, even then, I look back. And I, you know, I guess I'm blessed, but knock on wood. I don't really, I can't come up with any real obvious failure at any time in uh, my career. Um, I mean, you always go through little ups and downs, but uh, nothing I would consider a major catastrophe that changed you know, the, the career direction or, or, or risked putting a company out of business or? How about if you take it even more to a personal level where it wasn't so much about your company, but some experience you had even growing up where, I don't know if it's a failure or it, it resonated with you and maybe still influenced and had an uh, impact on your decision making going forward and maybe was, was part of uh, why you who you are today. Well, you're asking me hard questions here. Hey, they're on the list. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> because it's actually, because I got set on my career path when I was 13 years old in seventh grade. Wow. And it's been a steady uphill climb ever since. Uh, and I was pretty focused at the time. So, you know, it, I knew what I wanted to do and uh, I just pursued it and just ran. Anybody um, here want to know what it was that set him on his career path at 13? Because I definitely do. What was um, that? It was actually in a, a class I had at, at my junior high school, an electric shop class, which they don't have shop classes anymore, no hands-on classes in schools anymore, another problem we have. Uh, and I built this, uh, it was out of vacuum tubes, uh, an AM, FM shortwave radio uh, out of a Heathkit project and soldered all these wires together over the course of the semester and brought the thing into class at the end and plugged it in and sound came out. And I was so amazed by it that I said, it's, if it's the last thing I do, I'm gonna figure out how this thing works. And spent, I spent my career as an electrical engineer just so I could learn about radio technology. So, uh, and it was a 13 year old, I was a 13 year old kid at the time, so. But that's what it takes. It takes these hands-on experiences that somehow grasp you and, and just grab onto you and you say, it's my passion. I'm going to pursue that for the rest of my life. And that happened to be what set me on to be an electrical engineer. How about you, Paul? Well, I have to say, I, I have great deal of respect for my fellow panelists because they are struggling with innovation every day. Um, and, and let's face it, um, trying to be an innovator is kind of like being a race driver in, in an Indy 500 race. Um, only one guy wins at the end, and you have as much of a chance of winning as it is running, or, or much more, much greater chance of running into a wall, somewhere in, in between, or running into another car. So actually, when you take a look at the number of successes that happen, as opposed to number of failures, the ratio is really lopsided, uh, maybe two to 98. Uh, in terms of success to failure ratio. Um, I've had my share 
Um, and I, I've been also fortunate that overall it worked out, but I, the thing that I learned, uh, there was a period in time when we had set our minds that we were going to actually do a new product, and it had to come out at a certain time. And everybody pushed very hard, but when it came out, it wasn't quite ready. And it was a bad scene. Um, the lesson from that is don't do it unless it's 100%, 100% ready. And the, there's tremendous amount of momentum in any organization to get it out, and to, especially if there's competition, especially if there is rapid um, changes that are taking place in the marketplace. Don't do it. So that's what I learned. So just back on that, since we're talking to you, I think we all want to know, how did you come up with the idea for Hot Pockets? Hot Pockets. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, it's a good, good example of what I said earlier, I think, which was um, innovation comes because there's opportunity created by change. In the case of Hot Pockets, actually, there were two changes that were taking place simultaneously. Now, this is going to date me a little bit, right? But at, at that time, which was in the early 70s, two things were happening at the same time. One of them was more and more women were going to the workforce. So mo moms were going to the workforce, and they weren't home to welcome the kids back in and, and give them something to eat. Um, so the other thing that was happening in terms of change was microwave technology uh, had just been introduced. Uh, at the time we started with Hot Pockets, 1% of, of the households had microwave. Uh, within a few years, 99% did. Um, so I thought, okay, here's an opportunity to create something that fits a new pattern because, number one, if you could create a product that is very easy to heat, you don't need dishes, you don't make a mess, and you don't burn yourself as a kid, then it's something that moms might like. And it's a hot meal that the moms would feel good about giving to their kids. At the same time, it had to be very easy, very fast, and it couldn't involve an oven. It couldn't involve you know, anything that had a fire associated with or, or real heat. Microwave was perfect. So we caught those two together and created a product that actually fit um, those specifications. Um, and I think this is happening every day. Uh, changes happen in different fields that come together and create opportunities for new products. Well, let's talk about, Henry, so taking that idea, <clears throat> adapting to change, you guys are doing that constantly. I mean, it's an extremely rapidly changing world. What changes are you seeing now, if you can share them with us, that you're trying to drive to your company to adapt to? Well, I think, I mean, the technology industry changes unbelievably fast, and we see how fast companies go up and down. It, it's scary. You know, massive companies, you know, like Nokia or RIM that were glorious five years ago are struggling for their lives today. Um, so you have to be able to adapt to change if you want to survive, and uh, certainly in our business, in, in the chip business, it's the same thing. So you have to sort of look ahead a few years and try to predict First of all, who are the winners and losers out there that you want to partner with? You want to pick successful companies as partners. You know, we've picked Apple, we got really lucky. They've been extraordinarily successful. We picked Samsung, really lucky there, extraordinarily successful. We also did pick Nokia to partner with and weren't successful on that pick, but got two out of three right. So, um, and then work with them to try to predict where the consumer behavior is going to be so we can design our chips that work with their products to satisfy the needs of the consumer, which these days is very difficult to predict because you're dealing with kids. You know, we're over the hill. But they're not designing products for us anymore. They're designing products for teenagers. So you have to predict the behavior 
of teenagers and uh, see what they might like and not like. So what's the biggest challenge. change that you think we can understand that you guys are really uh, identifying and, and, and working toward to adapting to today? Well, I think the, the unbelievable growth of mobile devices is the biggest change we personally as a company have to adapt to and have adapted to. The explosion, everybody now has to have a smartphone, where five years ago, what was it? I mean, nobody didn't even knew what it was practically. Um, so we had to adapt our entire product line over to meet the needs of that smartphone segment of the market. Uh, and it's been a pretty rapid transformation requiring a huge investment and uh, a lot of work, but uh, it's paid off. Got it. Mike, how about you? you? You deal with human hearts. I mean, that's pretty timeless. Um, their need to be fixed and repaired is pretty timeless. You guys have been huge innovators. Is there change that you guys are having to adapt to other than regulatory, or is that your biggest challenge? No, 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 there's incredible change. And by the way, I just like listening to the other guys here because we'll be surrounded by this crowd and listen <laughs> to amazing, them. I, yeah. I'd rather listen than talk. But <laughs> no, there's, there's incredible change in the delivery of health care. I mean, number one, you've got this aging population going on, right? And heart disease is a progressive disease. In other words, it gets worse as you get older. So the need is going up dramatically. And guess what people want? They want to live, and they want to live forever. <laughs> and they want to live very high quality lives, right? And how much would they like to spend on that? Uh, not very much. So here, there's, your, there's, there's the problem to solve. And so this is, this is big, getting, you know, getting one of those right is kind of tough. Getting it all right, very inexpensive, high quality, increased mortality, tough problem to solve. We don't try and do everything. We, we stay in a couple of narrow niches where we're good at our critical care monitoring and structural heart disease. And structural heart disease are the things that happen to the structure of your heart, either that you're born with or happen with age. And we put all of our energy into it. And most of our energy now is, can you do that in some kind of way that you don't have to open the person up, right? Can you do it, it. very minimally, a small hole? Can you come in and do some magic and send them home in a day or two? That's, that's the challenge for our team to, to bring, make that a reality. So you think the biggest change that you're grappling with is increased demand, you've got this aging population and... Uh, and incredible pressure on cost. You know, what, what people tell us now is, yeah, that's nice that you're gonna extend life and improve quality, but you know, can you demonstrate that it's gonna lower the cost of the system? We, we, we can't afford it anymore, right? We don't, we don't have more money. Yeah. So, so talk to us about how to do that. Got it. How about you, Kim? Um, I think in pediatric medicine, so our organization is very committed to technology and advancing the, the field of medicine in pediatrics and has really embraced technology. So I, I would build on um, but what both these gentlemen have said. I think for us, the use of artificial intelligence in, in innovating pediatric healthcare is a huge opportunity. But one of the challenges we have is that most of the um, investments in advancing medicine in this country are around Medicare and the aging population. So make a little vow for our pediatric patients. Um, so oftentimes we are the site that is, that is testing and doing innovative things and developing like com uh, computer uh, physician order entry. We were one of two children's hospitals in the country and probably the world that did all of that initial research. So trying to pick it's unbelievable the number of opportunities that, that our team are thinking about, but trying to find the one or two that the technology is actually there and that you can begin innovation. So I think in our case, um, you'll see a lot of activity around uh, pediatric cardiovascular care and using the mobile devices and um, completely revamping the way we're providing care. There's, there are a lot of things I see day to day, but to see uh, four-pound ba premature baby with their chest sliced open that's gone through four or five open heart you, you know, you just go, there's a better way to take care of these kids, and they survive, but what they go through and the quality of life. So just, you know, t trying to get it right and trying to constantly drive innovation while driving down costs um, because people can't pay for it. So... You guys are all amazingly accomplished individuals. Uh, 
it didn't happen by chance. Obviously, there's a lot of hard work that goes behind accomplishing what you all have. If we could take it back, since Team Kids really is about influencing our youth, let's talk about maybe influences that you guys had in your youth. Henry, you gave us a great example. I mean, you had the great fortune of buying it. I had a youth kit when I was 14, too, by the way. And I did put it together and it worked, but um, you know, I went on to do something else. So you're fortunate that you found that passion and uh, it obviously had a big influence. Do you guys remember back when you were a kid, what were some, some things that were formational for you, an individual, maybe it was your teacher, Henry, in that class as well that really inspired you? It wasn't just the no, heat No, teachers kit. are so important uh, for inspiring kids. Uh, especially at young ages. If you have a, a great teacher in science, you may decide you're going to become a scientist. A great teacher in history, you want to become a historian. It, it, you're really influenced by teachers in uh, middle school and high school, definitely. So when you built that Heath kit, who was the teacher that was helping you? Yes. Who was it? Do you remember? Yeah, I remember his name. You remember all your junior high school teachers? What was his name? Four Acre Smith was his name. <laughs> <laughs> and what about him do you think had such an impact on you? Well, uh, maybe it, somehow I must have some affinity for electronics and electricity, but just I loved learning about electricity and, and, and electronic devices. It was just fascinating listening to him lecture and teach us about how electricity flows through wires and turns on light bulbs. And <laughs> I just loved it. I fell in love with it at, at that time. It's you guys, I mean, obviously you can feel it. You can feel it. How about you guys? Does that bring you back to any memories that, that were really pivotal? I, for me, I think um, exposure to different opportunities. I'm going to date myself, but first of all, thank you for the hot pockets because I was one of those moms that was serving that up. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you, thank you for being a customer. On. <laughs> but I, I think... Um, being exposed to things and having people that believe in you. So I grew up at a time where um, girls were supposed to be good at reading and communicate. I can't tell you how many teachers I had that you're not supposed to be good at math, you're not supposed to be interested in science. And it took one teacher and my dad to encourage, to, to find what you're interested in and you can do anything you put your mind to in encouraging a hard work ethic. Um, so it was in those formative years and, and being able to drown out all the, you know, you should take whatever. No, no, not that this isn't right, it wasn't right for a sewing class or a cooking class and encouraging you to follow your passion um, absolutely gave me the courage to pursue what I was interested in. So which, it was your dad and a particular teacher that you're thinking about? Uh, I can think about a science teacher who yeah. said it was okay, you know, to whatever, dissect the pig or, um, but my science and my math teachers were, it, 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 it is okay, you don't have to get, you know, channeled into a, a mainstream tereo, stereotype at the time. How old were you? Do you remember back? Was that junior high? Was I can remember school? being in second and third grade and having those teachers tell me that, um, you know, you shouldn't be so interested in math or science. Got it. Um, oh. And, you know, work on your handwriting or calligraphy or art or that kind of thing. I, and I can remember their names. <laughs> they're on your, they're <laughs> and on your I list. I didn't really love hearing it. So, but finally to get teachers that would went, wow, you know, you're smart in this area. You, go. You can do it. Got it. And my parents not um, dismissing it and encouraging me to follow what I was interested in. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Palo Alto and in Lafayette, Northern California. Mm, got it, got it. Oh, um, I'm actually sitting here and enjoying this conversation. I'm saying, <laughs> I picked a really good spot over here. Because, <laughs> you really did, actually. Because, you know, everybody is talking and I'm enjoying very much and, and uh, gives me a chance to think, what the hell am I gonna say now? And, <laughs> Not, not, but, but there is a disadvantage that by the time generally the question gets to me, these very eloquent people have said everything there is to be said and then nothing is left. But in this case, it's a personal uh, kind of story so I can talk about it. Um, for me, actually, um, coming to this country was a pivotal um, time and, and a pivotal event. Um, 
I was born in Iran. I came here when I was, I came by myself when I was 16, almost 17, going to, to go to college. Now, I was born, and I'm in a Jewish family, and who had already started from Russia, you know, and uh, gone to Azerbaijan, from there to Iran, and then to France, back to Iran, and then here. And uh, I'm, I'm not so sure, I mean, that, that my, you know, the story in the family is that it's, um, it was because of the pogroms and discrimination and all that, but we may have had some shady people in the family that always had to stay ahead of the law. So I really don't know which, <laughs> which one is true. Um, <laughs> so when I came over here, uh, I was a young kid, basically, and uh, couldn't speak the language, came over here and, and um, started, you know, started going to school. And two things really impressed me. One was the kindness of the American people as a whole. It was amazing. How they embra embraced me, how they tried to help me throughout. It's something that I always will cherish, and it's, it's a tremendous, um, good memory to have, um, and gives me great incentive to always give back to the country. Um, the other was the culture uh, of, of the people and the culture of this country. Those who are not, I mean, so, there are some here in, in this group, I'm sure, who were born somewhere else and came here, and know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, how precious that is, how wonderful it is. Uh, and how privileged we are to live in this country. Um, so that really made a difference. And, and, and I absorbed that culture and I said, man, if, if I can't help leave this place a little bit better than when I, when I found it, then I haven't done this country and I haven't done myself justice. Uh, so that was a pivotal moment. The other part of it was you come in when you're 16 or 17 and you don't, and, you know, you don't know the language. You have got to just throw yourself into it and learn and act independently. And you learn one thing. You can do almost anything. And it gives you maybe a cocky optimism, which can sometimes you know, really come back, you know, hit you in the face. But overall, I think it's better to be that way than you know, to be afraid. So one of, one of the things we, have we were talking about innovation earlier is you have to dare to dare. You really have to dare to dare. And how do you get to dare? Because if you don't dare, you will not get out there in front and do something that is really meaningful and different and risky. And that's what it takes. I'm going to come back to that in a second, but Mike, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I mean, a couple of different angles. Uh, you know, one is I was, uh, I went to grade school. I went to uh, St. Mark's in Gary, Indiana, so a Catholic kid. And so the, the hierarchy there, the, the priest was sort of up there. And so those were the, those were the, the guys that I looked up to. I think I even wanted to be a priest. When I grew up at one time until I sort of, I tried to figure out the hierarchy and how do you become the bishop and the pope and it was kind of murky stuff so I, <laughs> some, I got turned off at some point. But you know the, the different angle of probably had some influence on me was the team aspect of thing. I, I was fortunate enough to be on different kinds of teams, little league teams, you know, I was in the Cardinals or the Rug Company or the McInerney Ford and all this stuff and, and you know having those, the, having those team members together and trying to win and learning to lose and all that kind of stuff. It, there, was, there was something special about that. And I found I liked that, right? And it, uh, it, it gave me something to look forward to, something that I cared about, built some certain passion out. And yeah, there was always the hierarchical for it, but something about that team effort when you're in it together and the peer pressure and wanting to wanting to help that team and wanting to look good amongst that team sort of lifted you up. And it's one of those things that I sort of draw the connection with team kids. Uh, that, you know, I wonder if the fact that just these kids all come together with a common goal doesn't somehow create 
a certain kind of dynamic that lifts the whole group up. No, it's great. It's actually, it leads to a question that we had, which is, you know, you had these experience. It's the dare to dare. It's the be willing to do things that other people are telling you that maybe you shouldn't or couldn't. It's the team. It's the passion. How do you take those, those things that are your personal experiences and then translate that and teach it? How do you lead? How do you pass that on to your organization? and bring them up in that way? Anybody? Well, I think leading by example is always a, a great way uh, because when people around you just observe you and they see how you interact with people and see how you behave, um, it's contagious, especially if you're in a, a culture that's you know, striving to succeed and very competitive and hardworking. Uh, people like to mimic other people that are, are doing well and successful. So I think trying to lead by example is the best way to, um, to pass on those values to those around you. Anybody have anything to add to that one? That's a, certainly a great one. I, I think um, that what your attitude and your orientation and what you do with all of your life's experiences, um, and I, I harp on this with my own kids. I mean, the world is just filled with tragedy and negative thoughts and, you know, disaster after disaster. Um, and it, it goes back to what Henry's saying. I think um, how you approach your world and how, what type of example you set, whether it's a leader of your organization or your family or your friends is really critical. Um, and and you said something, you truly can accomplish anything you decide to accomplish. It really is all about you and having confidence and any one of us can make a difference in the life of someone else. Um, I just, I think really getting in touch with that and understanding that. I'm fortunate because I work in an environment where, if, you know, I start to have a little pity party. All I have to do is look around and it's like, okay, come on. Um, so it's a constant reminder to all of us of, of how we can make a difference in a life of someone else, whether it's an exchange at a grocery store or whatever. So just the attitude and the energy you bring, so I think So if you're going to if you're going to encapsulate your attitude when you walk around your organization, when you're dealing with your executives or, or anyone uh, within, you know, the the four of your company, what is the what is the one thing you want to exude? What's the, what do you try and do as a leader? Uh, positive energy, a focus on, on the contributions we're making, so respect, gratitude, um, not an arrogance, um, but respect for their expertise and what they bring, and encouragement. Encourage them to take risks. Encourage them to go the extra mile, and kind of get out of the way. Remove the roadblocks. So I think I can add something here, since at least two people have spoken, now I can, <laughs> I can. Um, you know, I've kind of like had to reinvent myself also uh, in the past uh, 10 years has been more getting into actually uh, finance and capital investments. I'm not going to say that this is not as respectable as, you know, as uh, being in the food business. I think finance doesn't have a really good aura about it. So we'll leave that behind because you're in that same business. Um, so we, we have an organization where we have hedge funds and, uh, and pri uh, private equity and, and real estate investments and so on. And so it has been a completely different thing. And so you, you start thinking about leadership. And Andy and I at the business school have had some conversations about, about that. And to my mind, um, I mean, to, to be a leader, if you take a look at, if you, if you kind of liken um, the flow through life, like going through um, a kind of a dangerous jungle, you don't know what's going to hit you when and how, um, the guys you're leading, uh, it's very important for them to trust you. They've got to trust you. They, they've got to figure out. If they don't believe that you can guide them through the danger and through the, uh, through the hardships and difficulties, they don't want to follow you. 
so I think that trust is probably the number one thing. Um, and it takes a lot of different elements. They've got to trust you that you know what the hell you're doing. They've got to trust you that you're honest with them, open with them. But you also have to mentor them, I think. You've got to mentor them because you, you want to have them grow. And, and each of them have a dream. So as a leader, you've got to allow them to, to realize their own dreams. Because if, if you can't do that, if they have to go with your dream, then you have failed as a leader. So these are the two things, or two or three things that I, I think are important, at least in terms of how I deal with it. Yeah, yeah you know, the, I think <laughs> all these points are, are critical, whether it's the leading by example or this positive attitude or establishing trust, and, and, and I'm 100% with them. Uh, the other thing that I always notice is, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> this trying to teach leadership and so forth. We tend to try and talk about it and so forth, and it doesn't have a lot of impact. There are certain, it feels like there are certain moments in time that we all remember when leaders separate themselves. And it's, it's not so tough to be a great leader when things are going pretty well and, uh, or when life's kind of routine. Uh, but when, when things are really tough, right, uh, then, then you find out a lot about leaders, and I think this, this, this being an example, uh, being true to your values and true to all those things that you talk about when times are good, uh, when times are really bad, mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that people notice. That's when you build trust. That's when the authenticity comes out. Um, that's when you can somehow be positive when you're going through a time when things aren't positive, and it makes all the difference in the world. I like to call them leadership tests, and they happen to all of us all the time, right? And, and that's the time when it probably matters most, when you have a good look in the mirror and say, time to, you know, straighten your backbone. Mm. Got it, yeah. Can you all envision times like that when Mike was talking about that point? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I won't ask you what they are, don't worry. Go ahead. <laughs> So, a couple more questions and then we're gonna open up to some Q&A in the audience. Um, if, you, if you had any piece of advice to pass on to people listening here, you know, some pearl of wisdom, it could be about leadership, it could be about life, it could be about parenting, um, what would it be? Uh, you know, it's not fair. Henry's next to no, me. He Paul always should has to go start. first. Ah. We should start with Paul. <laughs> 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 that's, that's a wide open. It um, is wide open. That's it, a wide open field. Um, I don't know, maybe parenting. What the hell? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very blessed. I have, you know, I have, I have good kids, so. Maybe I can kind of say, or I, maybe I did a couple of things right. I think my wife did most of them right. So I think one, the first rule of parenting is really get a good wife. That's, that's, <laughs> the, that's the number one Agreed. thing, I believe. Uh, and then don't, and try not to screw it up after that. Um, parenting. Um, I've been amazed as to how each of the kids have had their own personality from the day they were born. And any of you who are parents know that, right? They have their own personality. Same family, but they you know, go separate ways. And to my mind, probably the most important thing is for them to know a couple of things. One is you have to have passion in life for what you do. And if you don't have passion in life for what you do, don't do it. Find something else you can find, you can have passion for. Yeah. The other is, we I'll give you an, a, a, a little story. Uh, we lived in Colorado for about nine, nine years. And one of the most amazing things about Colorado is the Aspen Forest. And and what is amazing about them is you can go for miles and miles of this forest, and every aspen 
is actually connected by root to another aspen. All right? So the entire jungle of aspens is one organism, one giant organism. All right? and, I, and I believe that all of us as human beings are like those aspen trees. At some level, we are all connected at root to each other. And I think it's so important to, for the kids to realize that we do have a responsibility to each other. Uh, and this is what Teen Kids is all about, right? Um, and get them to, to understand that responsibility that you may be a tall tree, but you gotta give some sun to the next one next to you. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a key to uh, happiness, I'm simplifying all of this, of course, but it was a lot to parenting, but, but those are a couple of aspects that, that just come to me. That's great, thank you. Kim? It's tough Boy, one to follow. did I get the wrong chair. That's <laughs> a tough one to follow, man. Um, <laughs> I would emphasize the importance of um, staying true to yourself, to never, never, never compromise your own values, um, to trust, especially a young person, I think it's hard sometimes to really trust your intuition and your instinct. You, you have all this training and education and, you know, have I gone through the business plan, that kind of thing, to, to really trust yourself um, and that means recognizing where you need help. Um, so when I think about leadership, I, th I think the reason I've been successful is I've surrounded myself with fantastic people that are so much smarter than I am and not being afraid of that. Um, so that's kind of the cousin to marry well, is mm -hmm. surround yourself with the right kinds of people um, that share your passion and your values. Um, and, and we truly are all connected. So give back, make time to give back, uh, give time to help people, um, I, I think are important life lessons. Thank you. Yeah, I'd probably go in a similar direction as Kim. And I, you know, this idea of making that leadership style your own and being your own leader, being authentic to who you are, is the single most critical thing. I mean, you're, the think, you know, as much as we look up to Henry and say, maybe you just don't have that passion for electrical engineering and so forth, or you can't, through the power of your personality, you know, cause a, a hospital full of people to do miracles on kids or be able to see change in the future and connect the dots. But there are some things that are special about you, and that's, that's what you should try and capture and build on. Uh, I, I think that's the element we, we tend to, you know, we read a book by Jack Welch and try and be like Jack, well, we, you know, we're, we're not running GE, right? We're living our own lives. And I think being authentic to ourselves is so critical in that the other element that Kim talked about was, you know, this having great people around you. The, I'll, I'll add a little twist to that, having people around you that are really different than you, that think mm -hmm. different than you, that, you know, you also, the things you should know about yourself, the things you're not so hot at, right? So, you know, personally, not so much detail-oriented, right? And so it's really helpful to me to have people around me that are far more detail or, or maybe I don't think about where all the risks are, right? I tend to be more of the optimist. Having some people around that actually are thinking about where the problems are, it, it's very helpful. It's kept me out of a lot of problems. And, and being able to have a world that includes those folks and respect them and, and, and really value that advice and use it uh, to make your, yourself better and your, whatever you're involved in better, I think is important. Thank you. Henry, last pearl of wisdom, then we're sure. going to go to Q&A. Well, I think it's important to uh, define a set of values that are important to you and to live your life by them. And uh, it's kind of interesting story of how I went about defining them. Uh, we built this beautiful vacation home in uh, Colorado. David Ems has been there. He, he can vouch for that. <laughs> and uh, it, it's like this European chateau style. So we thought we'd give it a European flavor and build a family crest for this uh, beautiful home. So we looked up in the books all the different styles for family crests and the 
most of them, you know, they have all the lions and the crest in the middle, and then on the bottom they have a set of values for that family. So we thought about it very carefully and we selected three values uh, for our family that we felt were important to us. And the three are knowledge, integrity, and charity. And those were the three that we imprinted on the bottom of our family crest. Uh, and David's seen it. Uh, and those are the three values that we live our lives by in our family and uh, are very important to us. And I think if you can sit down and think about that and set those values and be true to those values, it will have an impact. Thank you. Hey, buddy, everybody, what do you think of this panel?